go look at multivariate image analysis, and it's not just to look at multivariate image analysis, but also to show how classical image analysis tools can be combined with multivariate tools. So image analysis is not something that's unique to uh, this course or multivariate imaging. Image analysis is widely used in all sorts of companies by robotic uh, companies. There's an infinite number of applications of classical machine vision or classical image analysis. Uh, so the, the other alternative name you'll see in companies more likely is machine vision. So using cameras to do something on the factory floor, monitor, control, predict. But we're going to look at how you can use multivariate image analysis and combine it with those traditional tools. And the credits for today's class, a lot of the slides and the material goes to Hong Lu Yu and uh, Jay Liu. Hong Lu now uh, works in Buffalo for Praxair, and Jay Liu uh, used to work at Samsung in Korea, and he's now got a faculty position at the university over there in Korea. Both of them, I was in the MACC group doing my master's at the time that they were doing their PhDs. So I've worked closely with them, and I, I, I've asked them for permission to talk about their projects here, and they, they've given me that permission for today's class. If this is an area that interests you and you want to get into it a lot more for maybe a course project or after, after you graduate here and work, work in a company, uh, the, the references I think you should know about are the following. Gonzales and Woods is the standard image processing textbook to learn about the classical machine vision tools. If you want an, a good background, um, this paper is on, just came out in a couple of months ago, it's on multivariate image analysis, and it's a, a good overview of all the history of MIA up till today's current state of the art. The book from 1997 by Gallardi and Gran is a great book just to get into the basics. It's super expensive, it's 300 plus dollars because of the full color images in it. There's a book now published 2007 by Gran and Gallardi uh, that uh, so just switched names around. They've done an update to that uh, with other authors. The, one of the basic papers in this area is Esmerson and Gallardi's paper, The Strategy of Multivariate Image Analysis. And then these students here at Mac have all looked at imaging as, as parts of their theses. Um, and so those are all available to you here, of course, at the university if you want more details. So uh, John McGregor's group has looked at Lumper, Pulpit, Paper, Steel, Industry, Snack Foods, which you've seen me use that example a few times. Um, Jun Liu has done a, a lot of interesting work on appearance monitoring. We'll talk about that at the end of the class today. Mark John looked at medical imaging, particular MRI images, and automatic diagnose, diagnostics from those. And then Jane looked at, at automatic grading of wheat. And then Emily, who just finished up this year, used near infrared cameras for oats and growths. And we'll actually take a look at this example in, in the next class in a bit more detail, because it actually leads into the next topic we're going to cover after this. Now, that little camera that's at the back of this class recording this uh, session here cost me about, I think, $700 taxes, all included. And that was four or five years ago. Very cheap for compared to any sort of sensor you can buy. A thermocouple for a company will cost in the order of $5,000. And flow, flow meters cost just in that range as well. So compared to those prices, cameras are actually super cheap. And they give you a lot of information, much, much more than a thermocouple or flow meter. Now, to be fair, that little camera at the back there is not suitable to be put on the factory floor. But so industrial machine vision cameras will cost in the order of two to three thousand dollars. You can get a very good machine vision camera for putting on a factory floor. If you want to pay in the order of fifteen thousand dollars, you can get a good near infrared camera. So by by comparison camera sensors are actually very, very inexpensive. And they work really well for the solids processing industry because the solids processing industry, they don't have a whole lot of sensors. If you look at gases and liquids, we can measure flow rates, temperatures, viscosities online, concentrations, all of those sorts of properties can be measured in real time. But for solids, we don't have much more other than flow rates. If you look at a, at a company that's processing foods or minerals, any solid processing product, they've got very, very little data compared to a liquid or gas processing facility. 
cameras also take non-destructive samples. They can be put online very easily, and they often complementary to other measurements you can can take with other sensors. Okay, so for, to understand today's class, we need to understand how the data for from an image is stored and how it looks like. Now, I'll give a bit of a background to that. We're going to consider data as a three-dimensional cube. Our x and our y dimensions represent the scene as seen by the camera. So if the light comes into the camera, we see the xy spatial dimensions. We've got the spectral dimension here, lambda, corresponding to the wavelengths, red, green, or blue. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Okay. An image with a single channel, we'll call that a grayscale image. <coughs> Images with three channels are usually color images, or they can certainly be shown on a computer screen as an RGB color image. And then if you've got multiple channels, we'll call those hyperspectral or multispectral images. Those sorts of images usually come from more expensive cameras, like near infrared cameras. And there's a trade-off. As we go to more and more wavelengths, we usually reduce the resolution. So the X, Y resolution you're familiar with the fact, like a megapixel camera, like the phone. My camera phone is a five megapixel camera. It's a very cheap, inexpensive sensor. But a near infrared sensor, there's not probably not enough money that you can pay to get a five megapixel NIR camera, not even military facilities. There's just no such thing because it doesn't exist. Okay. So those, as you go up with your number of wavelengths, you have to sacrifice on the X and Y spatial resolution. Uh, because of that additional cost. Though maybe the US government does have some satellite with near infrared channels at 5 megapixels, who knows? But commercially, you, you just couldn't get something with that level of resolution. Okay, so what we want from our images and what I hope to show today is we want to be able to monitor our process, we want to be able to make predictions from those images. Because these are real-time activities. We can monitor in real time. We can make predictions in real time. The optimization and improvement step, I won't consider in today's class. Uh, I'll leave that towards the end of the course. The final class in this course, I'll look at process improvement and optimization using latent variable methods. And then I'll, I'll bring in an image example in that, in that course. So we'll leave that topic for, for the final class. OK. How, how do we get our image data? Here's the main, the main form with which we acquire data is, is called a charged couple device. There is an alternative technology called CMOS, CMOS. Um, but by and large, most cameras that you deal with in your, in your cell phones, the camera in the back of the room, there's a CCD array. So it's a two-dimensional array inside the camera that's sensitive to light. And the lens that comes ahead of this, so there's a lens up front which passes the light, will focus the light coming in onto that region, the CCD. So those photons being received, uh, they're converted over to a voltage. That voltage is sampled uh, because that's a continuous signal, it's a continuous number. It's sampled and digitized and stored on, on, uh, on a disk or on the USB attached to that CCD. And that's what we deal with when we uh, find the acquire the data and what you store on the computer comes through that process. A near-infrared camera is slightly different because a near-infrared camera has multiple wavelengths that we have to collect. So it still has a two-dimensional CCD over here. Here's the upfront filters and, and lenses. But what the near infrared camera does, that here's an example shown here. This is actually from the near infrared camera that's in the basement of this building um, that's owned by the chemical engineering department. So here's the, the CCD array is housed inside this box. Here's the filters, uh, sorry, the lenses up front, and here's the image coming in. So there's a mirror that the light is coming up, being reflected off the mirror through the lenses onto the CCD in here. So there's a two-dimensional CCD. These lenses here actually split the light out into the different wavelengths. So the vertical axis here is the spectral axis. It's seeing the different colors of wavelengths, lambda. And the spatial axis, the horizontal axis, is just seeing a one-dimensional line of that image. 
So in order to capture the third dimension of the cube, what happens is this plate over here moves. And so as that moves, the camera is seeing the spatial axis changing, and it's able to acquire subsequent images and form up the three-dimensional cube. Whereas the usual camera, uh, you, that, for example, on your cell phone, you're just getting x and y spatial dimensions on your on your um, on the, on the CCD. The near infrared camera is only getting one axis of spatial information, one axis of spectral, and then it's acquiring multiple images in time in order to fill up the three-dimensional cube. Whereas the cell phone camera, when I click the button, it's acquiring the R, G, and V channels in X, Y locations in one go. Okay. Let me just actually jump ahead. There's a little thing you may not be aware of. These cheap sensors in, in your cell phone, or even if you pay good money for a handheld digital camera in the order of three, four hundred dollars, you're getting actually a pretty poor sensor for that money. What you're actually getting is a single CCD array. So there's only one of these CCD arrays, and it manufactures the red, the green, and the blue layer algorithmically. So the light comes in, and before it hits the CCD, which is shown here in gray, it passes through a red, green, or blue filter. So the light passes through the green filter, it filters out the blue and the red channels, and only allows the green to pass. So that CCD at that location over there is only seeing the green wavelength. This position on the CCD is only receiving the blue wavelength, and that position is only receiving the red information. Okay. So it's, you're not getting those, those, those pixels exactly superimposed. But it's actually you're getting those pixels side by side, and through some clever algorithms, it reconstructs what the, the R, the G, and the B layers would have been. If you pay a lot more money, what happens in the more expensive true color cameras is that the image comes in and gets split into three channels using a lens. And then you have a, 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 red, a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel, and each of those has their own CCD array. And that's capturing a true color image. But those are far more expensive because now you have to line up those CCDs perfectly to get the red, the green, and the blue pixels perfectly aligned. So those cost much more money. Um, but your everyday phone is a cell phone camera. It's actually just a single CCD chip. And this array is called the Bayer filter, named after the inventor from Kodak, who developed that. Okay, and then you reconstruct R, G, and B layers. So it's really a single channel image that's being acquired, but we're creating three channels from it, red, green, and blue. So that's a very, very basic background about how images are acquired. What we're going to be more interested in is once we've got the image data, what can we do with it? Okay, so image data is stored on your computer as a sequence of integers. And here I've shown a few examples. Red is stored as 255 in the red channel. The green channel is stores a zero, and the blue channel stores a zero. So a pure red pixel is 255, zero, zero. A pure green pixel is zero in red, 255 in the green, and zero in blue. And I've shown a few other combinations there for you. And the reason for the fact of zero to 255 is it's a, it's a nice number that fits in one byte of storage. One byte of storage on your computer is eight bits, and two to the eight is 256, so we can store 256 unique integers in one byte. Now, zero corresponds to black because at zero there's zero voltage being seen by the camera from the CCD array. 255 corresponds to the maximum intensity that can be uh, uh, taken and recorded by that CCD array. Medical images might use slightly more, so they'll 8 bits are usually not sufficient resolution. They'll go up to 10 or 12 bits. But because computers have to either store in 8, 8 bits, 16 bits, or a multiple of 8, so that the really uh, medical image stores in 16 bits but only uses the first 10 to 12 of those to, to digitize. Yeah. But they, they have a greater spectral resolution than the 
three day camp. By and large, the images you will deal with in practice coming from an industrial camera are just those one byte images, one byte per pixel, and numbers that range between zero to 255. Here's just a little in interesting tip, tip to note. If you store your images as JPEG, you're actually throwing away some information. The JPEG algorithm is what's called a lossy compression algorithm and throws away higher spectral frequencies that you're not able to see so well with your eye. Whereas if you store your image as PNG or a VMP, um, you get lossless compression. So PNG zips up your images and does it losslessly. VMP will store your full image but not do any compression. So PNP images are often very large in the computer. So if you've got a choice, stick to PNG uh, or VMP, but never pick a lossy compression format like JPEG because you're throwing away information. Okay, now we have to figure out how to display these images and visualize them. So if we take a color image, let's assume this was acquired by a true color camera. So we've got a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. One way to convert that over to a grayscale image of a single channel image now, in other words, we're compressing these three layers down to a single layer. We combine them usually with the following formula. We take one third red, 60% uh, sorry, that should be G, 60% green and 10% blue. And the reason for using more green than red or blue is just our eyes have far more green receptors in them than red or blue. And that's also, in fact, why if you look back at this Bayer filter, they'll use twice as many green locations as red and blue as well. It's because it's, a, it's more natural for us when we're looking at an image coming from that. It, it makes it visually it, the grayscale approximates what we see in color. Okay, so that weighting, don't use one third, one third, one third, red, green, and blue. You weight them accordingly to that to create your single channel image from the three channels. Now, once you've got a grayscale image over here, we've got a two-dimensional matrix with black values representing, represented by zero and white values over there represented by 255. <clears throat> now the human eye is able, uh, through studies they've shown that the human eye can roughly see 200 levels of gray uniquely. You can differentiate between about 200 levels of gray. But it's sometimes much easier to map each integer from between zero and 255 map each of those integers to a corresponding color. So map zeros over to a black color down here. Your 50s are blues, hundreds are cyans, up here are yellows, oranges, and then all the way back up to very bright red at 255. To recreate a color image, a false color image, from that grayscale. We'll use this technique quite a bit in today's class. Okay. <laughs> So even if you do acquire a grayscale image, or you happen to have only a grayscale image, in order to visualize it a little easier, it's, it's, it's helpful to, to map the, the integers over to different colors. Now this is not the only mapping you can choose. There's about 15 different mappings. Uh, and if you use MATLAB and use its uh, color map function in the image posting toolbox, they, they also provide several other mappings that you can use. And you can, when you, when you do this, it helps to bring out the contrast. For example, here in the birds under its uh, feathers, it helps to bring out that contrast quite a bit more. Maybe also this projector is not the best to, to visualize this, but here certainly you can't see the contrast going on in that gray region. But once you map the different colors according to the scale over here, you can pick up the features much more readily. So color mapping is, is widely used on grayscale. Color images are easy, easily visualized. That's the natural way that our computer monitors work. You've, you've got a three-channel image, an RGB image. You just tell the computer to show it, and it will naturally show the red channel, green and blue channel, and combine those pixels and form up a true color image. Here I've shown the reverse. What if we take this image and we break it down into the three 
channels, the red channel, the green, and the blue channel. I can show the red channel purely as reds, the green channel as greens and blues. And actually, that's what the computer is combining. If you look very carefully at your LCE monitor, or certainly on the older style computer screens, they had red pixels, green pixels, and blue pixels. And they would show each of these superimposed, and your eye sees that at the end. But really what that is, is that, that red channel is showing those features where this part of the, what you see is white, corresponding to 255, and those dark pixels over here, black. And then the green channel, you can see is very little green. I mean, the, the, these white pixels here represent the maximum green values. There's a lot more darker pixels in that green channel. And then the blue channel also has only very little blue over here around the bird's eye, really. So if you look at around the bird's eye, that's white, white, white here in the three channels. It's very blue, very green, very red. So that's a 255 in the red channel, a 255 in the green channel, and a 255 in the blue channel. Combine those three together and your eye sees pure white on the Is that this should be fairly straightforward. I think you've seen seen this maybe in other classes or the, the, the storage of, of image data. It's, it's something you're comfortable with. Yeah. <laughs> you don't feel too impressed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've seen it before, but that's really interesting. Okay. So what we're gonna deal with is we're gonna deal with the numbers behind the image. We're not going to be too interested in what the image might look like on the screen. We're going to convert and just deal with those numbers as our x matrix and work with them in PCA in, in today's class. So if we're looking at our images purely as numbers, I'm taking the same image now and I'm plotting the red channel, green channel, and blue channel on a scatter plot matrix. We can see here the distribution of pixels in that red channel. In that red channel, there's a lot of pixels with values at 255 and also a lot of pixels down here at, uh, at zero. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at it the wrong way. There's a lot of pixels up here at 250 and a lot of pixels down here at zero, which gives us this sort of uh, trimodal distribution over there. So the high values at 255 in the red channel are obviously the majority coming here from the center part of the image, a lot of the dark pixels over here at the side, and then we've got a mid-range. So that, purely from a histogram point of view, looking how the numbers from 0 to 255 are spread in the red channel, we get that distribution. The green channel, very, very much towards the lower values, to between 0 and 50 on the green channel. That's because we've got very little bright green pixels in the image. About the only bright green pixels are over here for the leaves but the majority of the green channel is towards the lower end, so much darker values. The blue channel follows the same pattern. In fact, the green and the blue channel are extremely correlated with each other, positively correlated. And then the red channel doesn't, doesn't have that same degree of correlation with the other two green and blue channels. So if you look at it purely from a variable point of view, this time we've got a red variable, a green variable, and a blue variable. There's strong correlation between the green and blue channels, but uh, not so much between red and blue and red and blue. Okay. So if we're looking at, at this purely from PCA, we're interested in correlations between the variables. Because how we get those correlations is as follows. If I take my three channel image, so I've got a red layer, a green layer, and a blue layer, so these are my red sensitive pixels, my green sensitive pixels, and my blue sensitive pixels. And I've got an image here very crudely drawn with one, two, three, four, five, six pixels in the horizontal direction, one, two, three, four pixels in the vertical direction. So a very simple uh, four rows by six column image with my red, green, and blue channels. What we do with PCA, we we obviously can't do a PCA on a three on a, on a cube, so we have to unfold it into a two-dimensional matrix and then do PCA on that. Now, how many ways can you unfold a cube of data into a two-dimensional matrix? Six. 
yeah, six unique ways that you can unfold it. So I've shown you one particular way over here. We'll, in two classes from now, we'll actually look at a different unfolding. But if we look at the, all of those six unfoldings, really there's only two of them that make sense for, for analyzing the correlations between the layers of the image. The first way is as shown here, where I, my first row is that first pixel in the 1, 1, 1 position. My second row in my unfolded matrix actually comes from the first row but the second column. My third row in the unfolded matrix comes from the third column in the first row. And so basically I'm working across the rows and then I go down. Red, green, blue, and then I repeat again. This is my second row begins over here, my third row begins over there, and I've cut off my, my uh, fourth row. Okay. I could alternatively unfold going down the rows first and then work my way across the columns. That would be the second of six ways to unfold the image. And you would get, if I unfolded going down the columns and then working across the rows, I would get exactly the same multivariate model. All I'm really doing, I'm taking the same layout, I'm gonna end up with three columns no matter which way I go. But in this first unfolding as shown here, I'm going to just order my pixels in the way shown. If I unfold going down the rows, I'm really just rearranging the order of my rows in that unfolded matrix. But I will still have three columns. If I build a PCA model on this particular ordering of pixels versus the ordering when I unfold going down the rows, I'll get the identical model. And that makes sense. If you think of a PCA, in this, in just think of it arbitrarily taking an, an, an X matrix and putting it into the software. And you build your PCA model on that particular matrix. If you take that same matrix and you just reorder the rows, do you expect to get a different PCA model? No, it's the same PCA model. We calculate exactly the same loading. The only thing different will be your scores will have the same numerical values, but just reordered. So it's the same idea with images. It doesn't really matter if we unfold, unfold one way or we unfold the other way, as long as we just unfold consistently. Yes. So in this, you're looking at the variation in each individual uh, column. Yeah, each channel. <clears throat> yeah. You're not looking at any of the like. So there, so it's it's considering each pixel as an observation. Exactly. Yeah. Each pixel is an observation. In this would it make sense in any cases to have it the other way around, where each color is an observation and each pixel is a is a uh, is a color a variable? Yeah, yeah. Color. You could certainly do that. You'd have very few rows though from which to build your model for most images. Sure. But if you have, I mean, I assume you use multiple uh, multiple images. But you're still saying you're just going to concatenate it side by side. You're still going to just grow your image. Right, you're just going to grow your matrix horizontally. I guess I was thinking about it the other way, where you're concatenating them this way. So it's like one pixel. I, I don't know if you have like no, a video no. stream or something, then you're talking yeah. about like one pixel. Uh, you're asking a good question because how you unfold your matrix is very much dependent on what you want to model. Right. Here we want to model the relationship between the color channels and see their correlation. If you're unfolding, as you say, you unfold the pixels horizontally and your rows become wavelengths. You're trying to model the relationships between the pixels. Between the pixels. Yeah. Yeah. And each wavelength, you're saying each wavelength is, it doesn't matter what my wavelengths are. Yeah. Yeah. So so like in the case where you have the chips going across the conveyor belt, you want to unfold this way. Because you're now it's not trying to see anything about the chips. Exactly. Like the chips are on the conveyor yeah. belt. And we'll 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 highlight that as we when we get to that case study. We'll look at that. Uh, so that, that approach, this is called matricizing your cube, you matricize your image. And, and what Brandon raises is an excellent point. Unfolded, there's so many data sets that are multidimensional. Here we're talking about two-dimensional data. But if you look at MRI data uh, from, uh, from medical imaging, those are four-dimensional cubes. And if you take an MRI image and you measure it over time, you've got a five-dimensional cube. And how do you choose to unfold that cube is going to determine what you're, what you're after, or be dependent on your objective, what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so 
we, we, we take our x matrix, each row is a pixel for an observation, our columns represent the number of wavelengths. Uh, MRI is it's x, y, z, and then what's the fourth dimension? It's, I'm going to have to look it up because I've just gone blank. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I know, I, I just, I read it just the other day, but I, yeah, I can't remember now, yeah, okay, yeah, because I've heard it before, but I, I, and I was looking up specifically to, I was thinking, what is that, oh, okay. now I can't remember, I, I'll send you also Ron John's thesis, if you look at those, so once X is unfolded, we have a very long, thin matrix, and you could, of course, go do the Nepal's algorithm on that X matrix, calculating the T's and P's interactively by, uh, by fitting those regression models. But far more efficient is to calculate the X transpose X matrix first, which is now a much, much smaller matrix. So instead of N, my number of rows, equal to the number of pixels, that's a very large number. K, my number of wavelengths, is always going to be smaller than the number of pixels in my image. For a red, green, blue color image, that's going to be three. So X transpose X is a three by three matrix. Once we've calculated that, that's the, that often is the longest step in calculating uh, a PCA model on images, just to calculate X transpose X. Once you have that, you calculate the eigenvectors of that, gets you your loadings. But that's just your loadings. We don't have our scores. Uh, the Nepal's algorithm, if we had gone and done the Nepal's algorithm here on X, we would calculate our scores T and our loadings P simultaneously. But if we just go and calculate x transpose x and then the eigenvectors, we're only going to get the loadings from that matrix. To back calculate what the scores would have been, we just say t is equal to x times p. Those scores t and those loadings p, you can prove it to yourself if you like, are exactly the same as the loadings and scores you would have obtained had you done the Nikhil's algorithm on the x matrix. And from this point onwards, we can just treat this as a normal PCA. Right, we've got our scores, we've got our loadings, we can go look at plots of T1 versus T2, we can go look at plots of P1 versus P2, we can go calculate the SPE, we can go calculate how times T squared. Any of the usual mechanisms you have for PCA can be applied to this. You just, your X matrix is just a different source of data. It's the only thing in this particular. The other thing you can also calculate is your residual matrix. So this is your residuals after calculating one component or two components. And, and I'll show you visually what, the, what those residual matrices look like. Okay, so like I said here, we can go look at all these plots. But really, we have to ask ourselves, if I had to go plot a T1 versus T2 plot from this image, I'm going to get, actually, if I take this, the, that dimension is my number of pixels. Chalk here. If I had to go plot a T1, T2 plot, what I get on that plot is just a huge mess, in fact, because I'm going to get one, one point on this plot per pixel. And for a standard cell phone camera, that's going to be about three to five million points on that plot. Just, you're just going to get a huge cloud of points that is not going to be very useful to you. Um, so we step back and ask ourselves, well, what do we really want from the score plot? <clears throat> what are the sort of things we use a score plot for? And, and mainly in this case, we're trying to find clusters in the score plot and see where we see, are there pixels with very high, high number of pixels in a certain region? So if I see a lot of pixels in this region of the T1, T2 plot, it indicates that I just have a large number of pixels in my image coming that have the same spectral characteristics that will land up at that location in T1, T2. So back in my, in my, sorry, back in my original image, if I have a pixel over here and I have a pixel over there, and they both happen to have the same RGB values, they're going to land up at the same location in T1, T2. And so what we're going to see in T1, T2 are clusters corresponding to pixels that have similar color back in the original image space. Okay, 
So our score plot in its native form, T1, T2, is not the most practical way to, to look at the image. So what we do instead is we, we just do a little scaling of the image, of the T score, and we try to visualize it back as an image. Because if you go look back at this dimension over here, this T1 column, you've got as many entries in that column as you've got pixels in your image. So what we can go do is take our T1 column vector and just refold it back up into an image. And we can go take our T2 column vector, look at that as a, as a grayscale image. So this is a grayscale image, a single channel image T1, a single channel grayscale image T2. If we had SPE, which I've forgotten to draw in over here, the square prediction error, one square prediction value per row, that can also be refolded up and look, looked at as an image. So what we do is, to try and display T1 as a, as a grayscale image, we have to realize, if I calculate T1, the properties of PCA tell me that T1 has going to have mean of zero, and it's going to have a certain standard deviation that I've shown here by this vertical distance. That is, T1, by definition, has a mean of zero. So if I want to look at that as a grayscale image on my computer, I have to just go stretch or shrink it up to fit between zero and 255. And I have to also round those values to integers between 0 and 255. T2 will also be a, a grayscale image, but it's going to have smaller variance than T1. So T1, mean of 0 with large variance. T2, mean of 0 also, but with smaller variance than T1. So I'm going to have to stretch that a little bit more than I had for T1. But I also stretch it up to lie between 0 and 255. So this is the formula that does the work for you. Um, Will, will stretch you between 0 and 255. And these angle brackets means round down. Okay, so that it's not missing a part here on the bracket, it just means round to an integer. And you have to round down, you can't round up. Okay, so the minimum value from this will be 0, the maximum value you get from this is 255. And now, now we can go display T1, T2 as a grayscale image. And we can go apply that color mapping that I showed you earlier to it to help visualize it. Okay. So I'll come back to that in a minute. One more thing. If we've gone and taken our T1 and T2 scaled images, now they now they're consist of integers between 0 and 255, what we can now go do is plot T1 versus T2. Scaled and scaled. And this is a value at zero. The maximum value on that axis is 255. This minimum value is zero. That's 255. And there's now 255 to the power two unique combinations in this in this image. Whereas back in the original unscaled T1, T2 values, there's millions and millions of unique combinations of T1, T2. But with this particular arrangement, where these are integers, I've got 255 columns, <laughs> etc., and I've got 255 rows. I've got far fewer unique combinations of, of scores, of T1, T2 values. So let me just recap, because a few of you look a little bit confused. What we've done here is I've taken my, my image, I've folded it, done PCA and I've calculated T1 and T2. T1 and T2 here is a continuous variable ranging from a low certain minimum, let's say minus 150, up to plus 150, and they're, they're, they've got, they've got uh, digits after the, sorry, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not rounded, they're not integers, right? They're, they're floating point values, that's the word. And they, so they've got decimal places. We can't display those on our computer as an image. So what we do is we simply shift and scale that T1 value to be an integer between 0 and 255, 0 and 255. If we plot T1 versus T2 over here, so this is a, a floating point value and a floating point value, the number of unique positions on this image is, is pretty much infinite. But once I've scaled these values to be integers lying between 0 and 255, now each pixel must lie in this image 
in one of these little tiny boxes, and there's 255 squared boxes in this image. So each pixel will lie in, in somewhere on this plot. So yes, I still got a, let's say I've got a billion pixels to start with. My score plot over here is still gonna have a, a million uh, dots on it, but a lot of those dots are gonna be superimposed. Two pixels with the same RG and E value, they're gonna get a T1 scale and a T2 scale value. And I can go plot them over here, and let's say they fall on that location. My next pixel, if it has the same R, G, and E combination, it's going to have the same T1 and T2 scale over here, and it's going to fall on exactly that same point. So what we do is we display this in the following manner. I go calculate my T1 and T2, and I go calculate this, this as an array in my computer with 255 rows, 255 columns. And I just place in that row and column position the number of pixels that have that T1, T2 combination. <coughs> and then I display it in what's called a two-dimensional histogram, with my x-axis is T1, my y-axis is T2, but I then color code the values proportional to the number of pixels at that bin. Okay. So let's take a look at that visually to help, help explain that. So what I've done here in the software Showing it to you. So this MacMia package was uh, something I wrote a few years ago for the for the university when they hired me. Um, so we've got file open, and you can go do this on any image. You can take an image on your cell phone and try this out. Um, I'm going to look at a, at a particular piece of wood. It's called a lumber image, and we've got 345 columns, 712 rows, and We've got three channels, so it's a, a pure red, green, blue image. And I'm going to calculate three principal components, and when I click continue and the image shows on the screen, that's done all the work. So there's calculated the PCA model and done all the work in that short amount of time. Okay. What we can see here now on this left-hand side is the original image, and on the right-hand side I'm showing you what T1 looks like. And it's a color-coded grayscale images with values it's zero, T1 equals zero. This corresponds to my smallest T1 values in the image. And reds correspond to my largest T1 values. So the majority of the wood over here in deep blue colors, they have very small T1 values. High values of T1 are in red. And they seem to correspond to some of these defects these knots and splits. So there's a split, these are tinier knots. So there's a, those red pixels, those darker colors, correspond to large T1 values. I can also go look at what the residuals look like after extracting the first component. So this is the SPE, the squared prediction error. What's not explained by the model, so pixels with low squared prediction error are in blue. These are close to the model plane. And pixels with large red values, these are far away from the model plane. I only use one component. So this particular defect in the wood is not well explained by the first component. And there's a few pixels up over here in this defect that are also poorly explained. So they've got slight red values. So residual after one PC, that's nothing more than the square prediction error, just shown as an image to you. If I calculate my second principal component, the same, same concept, now in T2, pixels with deep blue values and lighter, lighter blues, these are low T2 pixels, and you start to see the grain in the wood being picked up by the second component. The third, uh, and then high values of T2, really the second component is just modeling this defect of it. So remember that was, that was high SPE after one component. In other words, by adding the second component, I'm starting to explain that sort of feature in the image. So this, this defect is being explained now by T2. 
Now, let's go back here to the residuals. This is the SPE after one component, and these values range between 0 and 25. So 25 seems to be a very high residual value in the first component. If I go and show the residual after the second component, notice these numbers now only range between 1 to 8. So now most, I don't have any pixels with an SPE value greater than 8. All my pixels seem to be very close to the model plane. In other words, my residuals here have very little structure. So the two components seems to be able to explain most of the variation in this image. In fact, if I do go fit a, fit a third component, it will just explain exactly what you see here in this residual image. If I go back and look at principal component three, it's it's explaining very little structure, the, the, the last remaining structure in that image. But it, it is probably just fitting noise because it's just going to fit whatever you see here, the residual structure shown over there. If I go look at the residuals after the third PC, that's just a solid image. There's no, after you've extracted three components, you've explained everything in the next one. So if you took the scores, could you predict back like an actual art? The RGB image of like what you would claim that you have. Like after one component, would you say this is what the image looks like? like this is what we've explained? Yeah, you could just say x hat is t1, p1 transpose. And, and would that actually provide you any Absolutely. Image? It would look exactly like a colored image and it would show you what a reconstructed t1 is. So it shows you exactly what t1 is captured here. Yeah, yeah I, I should actually add that to the software. You can look at the reconstruction of hex T1. You can go look with two components. And then if you, if you add the third component back, there's no residual error. It will look like that. It will look like the original image. In fact, that is what Honglu did in her snack case study. Okay. With, uh, sorry, the flame case study. Before we got that break. Okay. Now, you can also go look at what the loadings are. Loadings P1 in this particular image represents. Yeah, sorry. Well, I'm just not sure um, why we do such an analysis like this. Like, okay. Yeah, actually, let, yeah. Put it this way. Let's just say we're just going to see what the hell if we put a, an image in as our X matrix. What are we going to get from it? Okay. You're going to see now in a minute what we might then be able to do. I'm just kind of leading you down the approach, well, what if we just put in an image and we, we play around with the idea of that? And then we can see how to use it after the break. We'll look at some applications of where it <coughs> might be useful. Yeah. The loadings P1, P2, they can be interpreted here. Firstly, if we take a look at the, the percent variation explained, we're seeing the first component explains 99% of the variation. The second component explains a very, very small amount, the third component is even less. And P1, the loadings for those are all the same sign, putting a little bit more weight on the red channel than the green or the blue channel. But really it's showing that that, that first component is just the average color in the image. Weighting a little bit more heavily to red than green and less so on blue. But really, that first component is just an average of the three channels. Yeah. Just to verify, they, they, you do center and scale for this still. Yeah, there's a glitch there. No, we don't. I'll uh -huh. talk about that in a minute. Yeah. We don't generally center and scale. And if, okay, well, let's talk about it now. If you do center and scale and you, and you don't, the results are very minor in difference. Really? Yes. Well, because I just, Looking at that loading, I would assume that that loading is just, this, like you said, describing the average. Yeah. I think like if you centered and scaled, that would be more meaningful. What happens is, you're, you're absolutely right, if you don't center and scale, so here's red, green, and blue. Yeah. And if I don't center and scale, these numbers are all positive. Right. They're zero to right. 55. But usually red, green, and blue, those pixels are very highly correlated in and off amongst themselves. They're all these usually positively correlated. So if you plot them, they usually fall in a zone like that, with a bit of noise filling, making a second component. So then usually the first component goes exactly in that direction anyway, as the majority of the pixels. Maybe not perfectly aligned, but it's generally aligned with the, their, their correlation amongst themselves. Then the second component will be orthogonal to that. And then 
and the third was. <laughs> I've never seen a case where pre-processing inheritance has actually helped me. And so it's more computational work for almost no gain. Yeah. And scaling is not unnecessary because all three pixel channels usually range between 0 and 255, so you're scaling, you're multiplying them all by the same number. We can go look at P2 as well. Uh, that explains the contrast between the red channel and the blue channel. So high T2 would mean we've got <coughs> lots of red and less B, R, G, and E. So the high T2 value would be high values of, of uh, red, low values of B. So you can interpret these loadings in exactly the same way. Then the final thing, and then we'll take a break after this, is let's take a look at the score plot now. So here I plot uh, T1 versus T2, and the intensity of the pixel you're seeing in this plot is proportional to the number of pixels that have that same T1, T2 combination. So over here where you see no red, there's no pixels with low T1 and low T2. Similarly, there's no pixels with high T1 and high T2. <coughs> Most of the pixels seem to have low T1 and high T2. Now, one thing you can go do, and this is where, I, where uh, people that use the software find it very helpful, is when I wrote it, I, I put a little thing in here that you can actually go, go between the two spaces. So if I click here in the image, it may not be apparent, but let's change this maybe. Yeah. Can you see those green pixels forming up there in that zone? Yeah. yeah. Those pixels that with that take that red, green, and blue value, that's where it maps into the corresponding T1, T2 location. If I uh, let's just go reset this where it may become more clear is if I let's just freeze that for a minute. If I go click in this particular defect all those pixels in that defect cluster in that location of T1 and T2. And if I go and draw what's called a mask in this region, and I say, go find me all the pixels that fall in this region and show them back in the image for me, it goes and does it like that. So all those pixels, any pixels that fall under this region in T1, T2 are these pixels that are marked, shown as white. So we're, we're seeing that that region of the score plot is capturing pixels with similar wavelength combinations to that defect. What I can go do is I can adjust this a little bit up and down and make, and make that a little bit bigger. And dynamically it's showing me and adding a little bit more and filling out that zone take out all these pixels over there. So there we're capturing that entire defect falls under this under this region of T1, T2. All those defects are caught in the same location. No matter where they occur spatially in the original image, that defect could lie anywhere in the image, but when I map it over to the score space, they always will fall under that region over there. Any guesses what this cluster is over here? That's unfair because you've got to move the notes. Uh, so if we uh, just reset over there. So all the pixels in that zone over there uh, correspond to this particular defect. So what's interesting is that this defect over here, while it looks similar in color to the other defects, actually lands up in a very different part of the score plot. And the reason is, uh, I forget the, the, the difference. <coughs> Some of these, these knots have a waxy substance in them, others don't. And so that waxy substance has a slightly different spectral characteristic, which causes it to show up in a lower, in a different part of the score plot. Whereas visually to your eye, you may not even be able to tell the difference between these defects. But spectrally, and the, the PCA model, remember all that PCA is doing is explain directions of variance and trying to separate out these clusters of variance. 
So it pulls out this cluster very different to that cluster over there. One final ni nice thing that you can go do with, um, with the software, let's just reset it over here, is there's this explore mode, which is if you don't know what, what different parts are of your image, you can just go move your mouse around and in real time, it will map backwards and forwards. So as I move that in that zone, it's doing all the PCA calculations and mapping between the two spaces and showing you what's in that zone of the scores. Let's go investigate this cluster here and you start to see all the grains of the wood showing up. So you can see here how fast and easy the calculations are. Just with real time with your mouse, you can, it, your, your computer can, can do all these calculations pretty quickly. You can also go back to the image space. As I move around there, it's showing that all those defects land up in that part of the score space. These, as I move through the general image, they show up in that big cluster. That defect is again out in that region. This defect over here, you see how you move out to that. So, okay, so you can have a lot of fun, fun with this. And <laughs> doing that. I, what I will do for you as a, as a non, I mean, it will be an assignment, but you don't have to hand it in. I'll give you a satellite image. The US government just recently um, has made publicly available a lot of their satellite imagery from the 1980s. So in the 1980s and 1970s, there was a big spend but on putting satellites up that had seven, seven channels. So they had red, green, blue, near infrared, and a few other channels. So these seven channel images are, are available to you. There is one built into the software. If you go file open, um, and there's a, a mobile Alabama. This is only a four channel satellite image, but I'll, I'll give you a seven channel satellite image that you can go play around with. And uh, so here you see some water, and you see uh, other parts of the land. And the reason why it doesn't look like water and so on is because there's four channels. So what do I assign as red, green, and blue, and near infrared? So there's different combinations um, you can look at. So you can go play around with this. You can go look at the different components. You can go look at the score space and try to find different features in the score space to the image space. So in fact, this is pretty sensitive. You can go identify the roads. You can go identify grass. You can, in fact, even identify golf courses because the golf courses use a special type of grass that looks slightly different. Okay, so let's take a break and we'll come back.